All right, is everybody intending to be at Moon Knight and DID? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so we've got our charity over here, uh, Helping Hands, if you want to donate to it. Uh, I think Dragon Con is matching some of the uh, money, so definitely donate. Um, and with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started with our panelists here. All right. Um, thanks, guys, so much for um, coming to today's talk, uh, and thanks for um, you know considering participating in this survey that I put out. I am about to reveal the results. So, 99 percent, uh, 99 people participated, and it looks like the majority of people said you know a bit about uh, DID or dissociative identity disorder. Um, about a third said uh, that they know very little. We have people in the audience who disclose that they themselves are diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. Um, and uh, many people who know someone who's been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. Uh, about 11% of the audience is a mental health professional. So um, how many people said, what is DID? Okay, one person. So. Um, yeah, so I guess I kind of wanted to know that because uh, this is my fourth year doing a talk like this, and every year it's just a, you know, people from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences I'll be talking about um, from my perspective, but um, I'm really uh, excited to have you guys here today and then um, hear, hear from more from you guys when we do the Q&A. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, whoops, you are here for Moon Knight and Associative Identity Disorder. I am going to, yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Brittany Ferguson. I am a PA. Um, so PA stands for physician assistant. Uh, we are medical providers. We can do a lot of different things. Uh, that's kind of like the point of being a PA. It's sort of similar to nurse practitioner in that we can specialize in a lot of different things. And for the first eight years of my career, I specialized in psychiatry. Um, the past year, I was a professor, and I'm actually making a change to HIV medicine. Um, you know, but just the big thing about me is, is that I have added qualifications in psychiatry and spent nearly a decade um, practicing psychiatry. Um, as I mentioned before, this is my fourth talk, um, and I was hoping that we could do an audience photo right off the bat so I don't forget. Sound good? <laughs> I didn't do it the first couple of years. It's so fun. All right. Um, so my self-assigned objectives for today is I'm going to introduce Moon Knight the character, define dissociative identity disorder specifically from the lens of the DSM-5, uh, which I'll talk more about in a second. Uh, we're going to highlight DID as represented in the Disney Plus show, Moon Knight, review treatment options for DID, dispel three major myths. I have a call to action for you all, and then hopefully we have sufficient time um, for some good Q&A. So there are spoilers. <laughs> I'm mostly going to talk about episodes one, two, and five, but there's only six episodes, so... Uh, <laughs> I also want to give a trigger warning or content warning. Um, it's impossible to talk about DID without talking about abuse and trauma. And so, you know, if you do find yourself um, having difficulty concentrating, having an emotional reaction, uh, I just 100% support you taking care of your emotional health um, and leaving, doing whatever you need to do to be able to do that. All right, so getting into Moon Knight. Um, Moon Knight, the character, was created in 1975 by the writer Doug Minch and artist Don Perlin. Um, before having their own um, comic, actually, they appeared in a comic called Werewolf by Night, issue 32. Uh, flash forward to 2022, and Moon Knight gets his own TV series for Disney+. Plus. Uh, the first character that is both in the TV show and the comic is Stephen Grant. Um, in the comic, though, Stephen Grant is 
kind of like a playboy billionaire. He's an American, uh, sort of like Marvel's Batman. Uh, whereas in the TV show, Stephen Grant is a museum gift shopist and British. <laughs> we also have Mark Spector, and in both the TV show and the comic, he is a American, Jewish American mercenary. Um, so these individuals don't look the same because they're identical twins, but rather they are two personalities in the same body. Um, and that's true in both the comic and in the TV show. So in both the comic and the TV so show, um, Moon Knight has dissociative identity disorder. That is um, a diagnosis that we would apply to the constellation of symptoms that he ex uh, experiences. And um, in the comic, originally they called his diagnosis schizophrenia, um, which was wrong. They were always portraying dissociative identity disorder, but they were just, uh, it's a real common thing to jumble up those diagnoses and they called it schizophrenia, it was never. Um, also in the comic, they kind of played up a little bit more on having you doubt the experiences that Moon Knight was telling you, like whether he really had powers or not. Um, whereas in the TV show, I think they really made a point to be like, nope, he has dissociative identity disorder, we're calling it that, and we're not gonna like confuse uh, like we're not gonna like doubt too much if that's happening or not like we're presenting it as this is what's happening um, so again we're gonna be talking about this through the lens of the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders um, the, it could be kind of problematic in a number of ways this isn't you know it's not like there are reasons to question the DSM but um, it is kind of the Bible of psychiatry. It is uh, what we use to diagnose, and it is a lens in which that we can start to understand uh, what goes on in dis dissociative identity disorder. There are a whole bunch of them. That's why I have them all listed up here. So diagnoses uh, didn't exist, existed later, were taken away. Uh, we are currently on DSM-5. So I'm probably going to go in between saying DID and dissociative identity disorder quite a bit. I'm talking about the same thing, DID, dissociative identity disorder. If you've ever heard of multiple personality disorder, um, that actually was the formal name of the diagnosis when it was first formally introduced as its own diagnosis in DSM-3. Um, but in DSM-4, that changed. They started calling it dissociative identity disorder. You may have also heard of the idea of split personalities. This is not a formal diagnosis. This is just a common colloquial term that people use typically to refer to dissociative identity disorder. Um, you've probably also heard about diagnoses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and those are not the same thing. Those are completely separate diagnoses. It makes sense, I think, why people get them a little bit confused. So for example, schizophrenia, the meaning of that word schizophrenia means split mind. And then bipolar refers to two poles of extremes of mood. But these are completely separate diagnoses. They look totally different. They're not the same thing. And they can't be used interchangeably, these words. Um, so here I have a couple of dissociative diagnoses and how common they are. I'll call your attention to dissociative identity disorder. So the 12-month prevalence, the likelihood that someone would um, start having DID in a 12-month period is about 1.5%. And 1.5, maybe that sounds like a small number, but it's actually a lot of people. So if you think about it, 99 people um, participated in the poll. There are more than 99 people in this room. One out of 100 are diagnosed with DID. And then we also know that several people um, did disclose that they have that diagnosis. So, uh, it's, you know, lots and lots and lots and lots of people. This isn't um, a rare occurrence, which is the first myth that I want to dispel. I think um, not only in just like average everyday you know, situations, but also among me mental health providers, there's this idea that DID is rare. It's not true. DID is not rare. DID, based off of that percentage, is actually more common than schizophrenia. Um, so very common. And you've probably seen DID represented uh, in media. Unfortunately, it has a long history of being represented in horror. Uh, 
which is a you know big personal like ugh, I, M. Night Shyamalan man I wish I could talk to that man so <laughs> I, I hate him so much like I don't know what his problem is but anyway so not helpful um, I think actors really enjoy the challenge of being able to play you know different roles within one uh, movie but it's not helpful there are some other uh, TV shows and movies out there that do try and portray DID a little bit more accurately, and so um, United States of Terra and Sybil being two examples of that. And then actually, Moon Knight is not the only character, character in Marvel to be diagnosed with DID. Um, in the comic, Legion, who is the son of Professor X, is also diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. That isn't true in the FX show. In the FX show, it's a totally different uh, representation of the character. But in the comic, yes, dissociative identity disorder. All right, so we're going to do a poll. And I would like for you to, if you feel comfortable, raise your hand if you have ever driven to your house completely sober and not remembered the actual drive there once you arrived. <laughs> yeah, OK, me too. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have completely lost track of time reading a book or watching a movie or TV show. Yeah. Netflix, binge watching, totally. Raise your hand if you've ever felt the strong urge to use the restroom, but it went away when you persisted in the work you needed to complete. So everyone who raised their hand has dissociated. Dissociation is defined as a disconnection between a person's thoughts, memories, feelings, actions, or sense of who they are. Uh, there are five primary symptoms of, that we uh, refer to as dissociation. There is amnesia. Uh, that's like forgetting. Forgetting, it could be forgetting long periods of time. It could be forgetting certain aspects of an event, short periods of time. Uh, but memory, right? Memory loss. Depersonalization is um, a detachment from your sense of self. And so sometimes that could be like when you're going autopilot, driving um, home. It could also be like um, being an outside observer of your own body. Derealization is detachment from your surroundings. Uh, they actually often go hand in hand, depersonalization and derealization, but derealization has to do with the surroundings part of you, not yourself, but your surroundings. So maybe things seem dreamlike or foggy. Maybe it's like a haze, like you're in a movie or a dream. Identity confusion is having some sort of conflict or confusion about who you are while identity alteration is having an actual change in your personality or your behavior. And so 50% of people will experience depersonalization or derealization in their life. It's just normal, right? It just happens. Totally normal. Now, dissociation does have a strong connection to trauma. So it's normal to dissociate in sort of every day-to-day -day life you know, some people dissociate more than others. Uh, it is also completely normal to dissociate when a stressful event is happening or a traumatic event is happening. And so uh, Life of Pi, I think, is like one very popular example of that. Um, just to sort of like briefly summarize, a man goes through what is a very traumatic event, but experiences it in sort of a very fantastical way, separating the people and the real events that occurred into a more um, replacing people with animals. Um, and so when a stressful event occurs, it's, it's incredibly common um, to dissociate. So like being in a major car accident and when the paramedics remove your body from the car, seeing it happen as if you're like a third person. That's something I hear all the time, right? Just very, very common. Uh, so dissociation plus trauma, it could be a survival tool like numbing out or experiencing it as dreamlike or surreal could help lessen the stress of the actual traumatic event. <clears throat> That's why uh, we think dissociation occurs and why it's so common. Um, it could be meant to serve that purpose, but ultimately actually that person find that unhelpful. So um, an example of that would be my loved one died <clears throat> and I just cannot remember the ceremony of 
um, at their funeral, right? And that causes me a lot of pain because like, I feel like I didn't get to say goodbye. <clears throat> And then also dissociation plus trauma could lead to what we end up giving a diagnosis for. And so just in general, when I talk about the idea of DSM diagnoses, it is a constellation of symptoms that we see in people. Uh, we see them time and time again. Uh, we put a name to it. And the purpose of that is to research it, understand it better, and guide treatment, right? Uh, so I, I try not to use words like illnesses, disorder, things like that. DSM diagnosis is how I prefer to talk about it. Um, and then I put disorders on the slide. But anyway, so DSM diagnoses <laughs> with dissociation. And um, there are actually more than this, but the ones that have dissociation as a part of the actual criteria to diagnose them is DID, dissociative amnesia, depersonalization slash derealization disorder, those are all classified as dissociative disorders. And then outside of dissociative disorders, we also have PTSD. PTSD has, um, can be specified as with dissociative symptoms like depersonalization, derealization, but also within its criteria, there are things like emotional numbing, feeling detached from people and, re and forgetting important aspects of the traumatic event. All of that is actually part of DSM criteria. In borderline personality, disorder, the criteria, there's like 10, and you don't have to have all of them, but one of them is severe dissociative symptoms. So all of these disorders experience dissociation. Um, for DID, the risk factors uh, to get this diagnosis is um, all surrounding around trauma, specifically early abuse, like before the age of six, uh, prolonged abuse, like an average of about 10 years of, of an abusive situation. And typically that abuse is physical and or sexual abuse. When we look at people who are diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, about 83% have experienced child sexual abuse, 81% childhood physical abuse, and then 94% any childhood trauma. So trauma is the overwhelming uh, picture in, as a risk factor for dissociative identity disorder. For Moon Knight, uh, first he lost his brother in a very traumatic way at a, at a young age. And then subsequent to that, he experienced both emotional and physical abuse from his mother. And so not only is abuse um, a risk factor for DID. It's actually a part of the pathogenesis, how we understand why it occurs. Like, how is it that someone goes, goes about ending up having these experiences? Um, so we talked about dissociation as sort of a, a coping mechanism. So same, same thing here, right? Traumatic things are happening. A person is dissociating to cope with the stress of what's going on. Um, and you know, part of that is by detaching from the experience, but also alters can serve as sort of like a protector. Um, basically, it doesn't just happen like one day to the next. It's sort of like over time, a person is doing that. They do it more and more and more. And then maybe even eventually, they're doing it in situations where the stressor is less, right? Um, it becomes like a habituated or a learned um, way to deal with stress. And that was the case for Moon Knight. So uh, Stephen Grant, when danger is here, Stephen Grant has no fear. Uh, Stephen would come and uh, you know have no fear, maybe have no idea what was really going on for him. Um, at least that's sort of how it's portrayed in that one episode. And you know save Mark from the experience of abuse from his mother. Uh, so now we're going to get into the actual DSM criteria. This is it at a glance. We're going to go through um, each of these criteria. There's five. Uh, so criteria A, there's a disruption in identity characterized by two or more distinct personality states. Yeah, we have that, right? So we have um, Mark Spector and we have Stephen Grant. In some cultures, um, this may be described as possession. That's how it's worded in DSM-5. but. Uh, you know, I don't know, I think someone could read that and think like, oh, culture is over there, not my culture. It's, it's really, really common, like within our culture here in the United States for people to wonder if they could be possessed because of the way, um, the way that 
it, the experience is going on, feeling like you don't have control over your body or not remembering doing things. So really, really common to initially think that maybe you're, you're possessed. Um, which I thought when I was first watching the first episode, I wondered if they were gonna go that way with Katu, because Katu actually literally does possess him to become the Moon Knight and give him his powers and things, but no, that's completely distinct from dissociative identity disorder in these series, right? So he has dissociative identity disorder, and then separate from that, Katu, um, it, he's uh, Katu's avatar. The disruption in identity has to have marked discontinuity in the sense of self and sense of agency. Again, we see this uh, initially in Stephen. Uh, Stephen says, I don't know, I just like have to get my 10,000 steps in. I just like end up walking, who knows where. So to try and prevent this thing that it feels like he can't stop from happening, he's putting glass in his shoes, he's tying himself to his bed, because uh, he doesn't have a sense of agency of, of what he does when he goes to sleep. Um, what did I say? You said that he put glass in his shoes. The Stephen Grant character Oh, really? That's Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke character. And it's part of his whole aesthetic, yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, so he ties himself to his bed to yes. stop to stop that. Okay. I don't know where I got that from. I was so convinced. Thank you. Okay. So, um... Uh, this should all be accompanied by related alterations in affect, behavior, consciousness, memory, perception, cognition, and sensory motor functioning. So um, there's a lot of words, but basically like there are changes in the way the person acts, the way they, they interrelate, the expressions on their face, the way they think. Um, and for this example, what we see is a Stephen Grant, just like as a big example, Stephen Grant has a British accent while Mark Spector does not. And Mark Spector has like weapon skills, hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, and initially Stephen says he doesn't have access to those, um, to those things. So moving on to criteria B, there has to be recurrent gaps in the recall of everyday events, important personal information, and or traumatic events that are inconsistent with normal forgetting. Uh, so you know, initially we see Stephen Grant totally trying to make it on that hot date, but showing up a couple days too late. Also later on we find out that while Mark was aware that he had a brother, uh, Stephen was not. Um, you ha this has to cause significant distress or impairment for the individual. I'm just going to go ahead and say yes. <laughs> and um, the disturbance can't be a normal part of broadly accepted cultural or religious practice. I think that gets like a little bit nebulous just a, a lot of times. And then, you know, if we're talking about demonic possession and cultures that believe in that more so than others, I don't know. But maybe a, maybe a better, clearer example I could give you is um, and someone tell me if, if this isn't right, but I was thinking um, for Pentecostal holiness and some other religions, um, it is a gift, it is a spiritual gift to um, be able to speak in tongues. So speaking in tongues being um, like speaking another language that you had no prior knowledge of, and when that happens, it's a really good thing. So um, that is accepted in that religion that would not classify as criteria for what we're talking about. Also in children, the symptoms can't be better explained by imaginary playmates or fantasy play. It is incredibly common for kids to have um, imaginary friends and to engage in imaginatory play. And I'm not saying that like distinguishing between those is supposed to be easy or anything like that, but it is incredibly important to know that you know if you have a young person in your life and they have an imaginary friend, it isn't automatically dissociative identity disorder. That's a, just a different thing that happens um, and is totally uh, within the realm of things that people experience. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and say uh, criteria D is met. Criteria E, our final criteria, is, is that these experiences can't be better attributable to substances like getting blackout drunk at Dragon Con, <laughs> um, or medical conditions like uh, seizures, dementia, things like that. We haven't done a, medical history, we haven't 
done a workup, so I don't know. We'll just uh, ignore this criteria for, for Mark and Stephen. Moving on to treatment, the mainstay of treatment for dissociative identity disorder is going to be therapy. And there's a lot of different therapies that exist. I just put up some like broad classifications of, of therapies, like cognitive behavioral therapy can be used to treat a whole lot of different things, depression, anxiety, you name it, the uh, schizophrenia. Um, and you modify it, right, depending on what you're treating. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. Uh, oh, I should say cognitive behavioral therapy has to do with like your thoughts and your behaviors and, and how that influences uh, the way you are in the world. Uh, so for um, dialectical behavioral therapy, there are four main skills that are targeted there. Mindfulness, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, and emotion regulation. It's uh, used for also a wide variety of diagnoses like substance use disorders, borderline personality disorder, psychosis. Um, and then finally, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. This is the one that I know the least about, but basically a visual stimulation is paired with um, traumatic memories a person has, and through um, the coupling of those things, people can relearn thought patterns that are no longer serving them. Uh, you hear about this a lot also in the treatment of PTSD. So therapy is the mainstay of treatment, but medications can and are um, prescribed in dissociative identity disorder. There isn't like a FDA approved medication for DID, um, but uh, the way you'll see them be used is for one, symptom management. And what that means is like a person is diagnosed with DID and maybe they're experiencing a lot of anxiety and you wanna give them some relief from that anxiety. So you prescribe something to help them have relief from that. Um, DID is also very highly comorbid, meaning that other disorders co-occur at the same time. So if a person is diagnosed with DID and major depression, you're gonna be treating the major depression. And there are medications that have FDA indications for that. Um, I don't you know, mean to put us mental health professionals like off the hook. I do think, um, in an ideal world, anyone with D, uh, experiencing symptoms of DID could go to any mental health provider and then be like, yep, I'm good, I'm solid. Um, I don't know if that's really the case. So in terms of finding a specialist, I wanted to put up this resource, the International Society of the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. If you look in this um, right hand corner, you can click that button, put in your zip code, put in a lot of different things about what you might prefer in a therapist, like, um, if they have a certain religion, a certain gender, um, a lot of different things. And um, when I did that for my zip code, which is here in Atlanta, I got about 30 hits. In terms of treatment for uh, that we see within Moon Knight, that's primarily in episode five, where um, Moon Knight finds himself in a psychiatric hospital and Harlow is somehow the psychiatrist. Um, I really liked this episode because, you know, right off the bat, we have um, Mark sort of really doubting himself um, and like what's been going on, which I think is a common experience um, getting into like mental health treatment. I think that like getting hospitalized is actually a really traumatic event. So I thought the way they portrayed that here um, was really emotionally effective at least. So he says, talking hippo, talking dead bird, and now the afterlife. <laughs> yeah, that's the reality. The hospital here, that's the imagination. Luckily, uh, Stephen is there to kind of pull him back in. And, um, and then I think that maybe the episode, or at least how I took it, was, it was sort of an allegory for, for two diaposing um, theologies in treatment. The first being symptom remission. A lot of uh, mental health treatment is sort of focus that way, right? Like, we're gonna try and get rid of the symptoms and then that's effective treatment. In dissociative identity disorder, they call that um, the integration of personalities. Like maybe the goal of therapy is so that rather than having two, three, four separate personalities, um, that they would integrate into one personality and, um, and that be it. And so, you know, they're kind of running around trying to get their hearts balanced. Um, you're sort of wondering, oh, are they not balancing because there's a third altar out there? Um, 
And uh, Mark, you know, the scales do balance, and Mark is um, allowed to go to this glowy field of wheat uh, once Stephen falls falls off the ship and is no longer a part of the picture. So they're like, oh, your, your scale's balanced. You've achieved symptom remission, right? Uh, but then they show us this alternate viewpoint, which is recovery. Recovery being, regardless of any symptoms I may or may not have, that's not the point. I'm just trying to live my best life, right? So multiple personalities, depression, whatever, you know? Like, that's not, I'm not trying to get rid of those. I'm just trying to be my best self. And so we see Mark say, now I can't have this. And he goes back for Stephen and he says, you know, I survived because I knew I wasn't alone. You protected me. I'm not going to abandon you. And you're the only real superpower I ever had. Yeah, and they hugged and it was very sweet. I loved it. Yeah. Sure. Um, that's a really good question. I think that uh, there might be like different ideas about what should happen or what shouldn't happen. And, and I do think that sometimes that people, um, well, certainly what happens is it's a melding of, of different aspects, right? And so maybe the, the one personality had this, 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 and another, that, that, that. Um, so, I don't know, it's sort of hard for me to talk about because I also want to just immediately say, like sometimes people, um, they're, when they're integrated, they, have, they go by a different name, right? And they experience it as um, being either like a compilation or just like a new, kind of like a new different way of being. Does that answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> um, so last thing about um, this episode is uh, just having to do with Harrow and how he comes across. Initially, I had sort of a hard time because I was like, he's the bad guy. He's being sort of, well, he's being paternalistic quite a bit, you know, handing over the phone and be like, do you want to talk to your mom? Even though he knew that she was deceased, just like really not helpful. But um, ultimately, I kind of wondered if they were trying to portray him as taking this like participant observer stance. And what that is, is um, you know, if a person comes into my office and um, they're saying, you know, uh, they're, you know, coming in and they're, they're Stephen, I'm talking to them as Stephen, I'm learning about Stephen's thoughts, Stephen's experiences, Mark comes in, I'm talking to Mark, Mark's experiences, um, and maybe I have my own ideas about what's going on, right? So like if Stephen is unaware of Mark, for example, and I'm aware of that, but I'm not like necessarily bringing that into the room right off the bat. And the reason why this really struck me is because I actually think that this wouldn't be what would happen um, always. Like actually a lot of mental health providers do not believe the dissociative identity disorder is real. They might refuse to speak um, to a person how they want to be spoken to, right? So like no matter if they're saying their name is Steven, they're still calling them Mark. Um, so, so that really struck me that, that you know, ultimately, uh, Harrow is saying, yes, I'm, I'm taking you as you're coming to me. Um, so <laughs> where I'm going with this is DID is uh, controversial. That's, that's what people say in mental health. Just some examples here of like relatively recent publications. DID remains controversial. DID has been associated with controversy. This last one up to date is like a really common desk reference that medical providers would look at and right off the bat it says DID is a controversial diagnosis. And what they mean by this, or at least how I interpret when many, many people have said this to me, um, is that it is controversial because some people believe it is a legitimate diagnosis. It is something that people experience and some med medical professionals do not, like people publishing papers, right? Uh, so this is the next myth that I wanted to spell, which is that uh, the myth that DID isn't real. <clears throat> uh, to talk about that a little bit, I'm gonna tell you what I was trained, what I was trained for all of my career. So I was trained in the sociocognitive model, uh, AKA DID is caused by therapists. And the way that this story goes is in the 70s and 80s, 
Um, a very famous case, uh, The Faces of Eve, came out. This woman had multiple um, personalities. It was published. People were curious by it. And so when a patient would come into a therapist's office, and they'd be acting a little bit different that day, instead of asking, what's going on with you today? They would ask, who are you today? And patients wanting to please their providers would sort of roll with that. And eventually through that line of interaction, people would formulate the idea that they had multiple personalities, right? And so if they hadn't gone into the therapist's office, they would have never had that idea. Um, so, you know, this theory basically breaks down to the idea that it was like a contagion, um, or also like a hypnosis, well, still still happens but I think like people were being put under hypnosis and uh, highly suggest suggestible and maybe that was part of it the idea is that it was a medical fad time bound um, but really there you know whatever did happen in the 70s and 80s there's really no evidence to support that when people end up uh, getting diagnosed with DID that that sort of experience can be started and sustained by the relationship between a patient and a provider. I mean, these sort of experiences are happening starting in childhood, right? Um, and so here's just some, a couple of references that um, dispel that myth. All right, you guys ready for a quiz? You guys still have your uh, apps open? <laughs> if you didn't click out, it's still there. <laughs> So I'll read it um, out loud. True or false, people diagnosed with DID have two or more personalities, aka alters, uh, that are easily recognized and distinct from each other. Give you guys a couple more seconds. When I see 99, I'll probably click. Which way is it going to go? Okay. So 80% of people, well, 78% of people said true, and 23% said false. We have someone change their mind. <laughs> OK. Um, so it's a, a myth, yeah. Um, I know I just told you guys DSM criteria was that people with DID have two or more distinct personalities. I literally just said that, right? That was a part of my. So the nuance here is that um, alters are actually not always easily distinguished. That is how the DSM defines this diagnosis. And actually, for um, big advocates of DID, researchers of DID, they have a really big problem with how this diagnosis is listed in DSM because it, it leads to um, people missing this diagnosis. So alters, in reality, uh, they can be indistinct. They can pass for one another. Um, switching between personalities can be infrequent, like years. Switching can be rapid, like as quick as like uh, emotion, the shift of an emotional expression. And so, you know, if you're waiting uh, for someone to come into your office or, you know, a friend who's told you that they have this diagnosis, you're waiting to see these really rapid shifts in personality to, um, to think that the person has DID or to believe this person who's telling you that they do, uh, you're going to miss it, right? Like, that's just not um, really what goes on. And actually, it might be the case that complete switching from one personality to another is actually relatively rare in the experience of dissociative identity disorder, um, which isn't to say it doesn't happen. It does happen, but there are estimates that that's about 10% of people who have this diagnosis. So, you know, again, just with uh, Moon Knight, we see him shifting multiple times, his eyes rolling back into his head. We even see he's like trying to give Harrow the scarab and his arms moving around. If you're looking for something as dramatic as that, um, 
it's, you're just, it's not really what it's like for the majority of people who experience this. Um, in addition uh, to this, this myth this we just dispelled, I wanted to point out, you know, disorders that um, have symptom overlap with DID is actually very many. Uh, before I told you about which disorders have dissociative features in the diagnosis, but you know, beyond that, there's all these other disorders that have a lot of other symptoms in common. Uh, so PTSD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Uh, just to highlight like one example of that, uh, did you guys know that in both dissociative identity disorder and in schizophrenia, people can hear voices? Um, and you know, maybe that's part of why sometimes people experience it initially as like, am I being possessed? Because they're hearing the voices of their alters. Um, maybe there are some ways we could think about uh, helping like tease that apart. Like maybe in DID, uh, the voices are going to be more highly personified uh, because they are the voices of, of the alters. But actually, um, you can have personified voices in schizophrenia too. So. Um, maybe in DID, the voices are heard more often like within their head rather than hearing it um, somewhere else in the room or uh, just outside the head. But uh, people diagnosed with schizophrenia, experiencing schizophrenia, they can hear voices inside uh, their, their head as well. Maybe the voices in DID, you can distinguish it because they begin in childhood. But again, there's also something called childhood schizophrenia. So. I mentioned before that uh, DID is highly comorbid with multiple other diagnoses. Um, so here's just some, some stats about that. 79 to 100% of people diagnosed with DID also meet criteria for PTSD. Up to 96% are also di uh, can be diagnosed with major depression, 96% substance use, uh, personality disorders, somatic symptom disorders. And my point in sharing all of this is, is that, so if we have lack of training or acceptance uh, by medical professionals, coupled with how many other diagnoses there are symptom overlap with, coupled with how many diagnoses can be going on at the same time as dissociative identity disorder, <clears throat> what we get is major delays in diagnosis um, and inaccurate treatment, which just means that people with this are you know, not getting the help that they're requesting for by medical professionals. Uh, so uh, this is me wrapping up with my call to action. Um, here are some resources that you can learn more about dissociative identity disorder, um, refer to uh, friends and loved ones, National Alliance of Mental Illness. I think that that's just a good starting point if you're curious about anything mental health related. Um, just start there, it updates all the time. In terms of specific dissociative resources, the Sidron Institute and then the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation are both great resources. Um, to educate yourself, to educate others, and to battle stigma. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how important it is to uh, highlight the voices of people with lived experience. So, um, I have watched a lot of the YouTube videos from Dissocia Did, um, a alter system who does a lot of education about their experiences with dissociative identity disorder. And then there's also Dr. Adrienne Fletcher. She's a psychologist, um, specializes in dissociative identity disorder, and is also diagnosed herself. So she comes from a perspective of both professional and lived experience and um, has a lot of articles out there that you can see, one's on NAMI. Um, the key takeaways I hope you guys take away from today's talk, dissociation is a normal human experience. Dissociation is a survival tool. And DID is a real thing experienced by real people. These are my references. Ladies, gators. <laughs> um, are we doing more?
uh, we're going to start over here and one section at a time and we'll get to everybody, okay? Should I stop, share? I don't know if you guys knew that your names were going to come up. Okay, who over here? Question? All right. I'll stop sharing. Uh, this wasn't a question. I just wanted to throw in um, another uh, reference information source for you. Okay. Uh, there's the Plural Association, which is an international nonprofit based in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's also run by a DID system, the Stronghold System. It's the Plural Asso Association, abbreviated to TPA. And uh, they're president, I guess, the Stronghold System also has a, a YouTube channel. I think it's also called the Plural Association on YouTube. Awesome. That has a lot of resources for educating, like, for systems and also for people who want to know more. Thank you so much. I wrote it down. Plural, oh. well, I'm, I'm going to say it so everyone here. Plural associ Association is uh, the, the reference that so he was I'm talking about. Back to you, okay. I thank you. Great talk. Um, I thought you contradicted yourself, and it might be that both things can happen. And it's the question of remembering what happened when you were in one personality versus another. Um, and is it an always you don't remember it, always you do remember it, or sometimes yes and sometimes no? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll start off. Um by answering that, you know, I thought about starting this whole talk off by giving my answers to that poll that I gave. And if I did, I would have marked, yes, I'm a mental health professional and I know a bit about DID. I have a lot of unlearning I've had to do in my career. Um, and actually my specialty was psychosis. So I had to do a lot of unlearning. So, uh, you know, if I said something wrong, please like, Every, you know, this is the time to share it. So in terms of uh, what I said before and how I may or may not have contradicted myself, I do believe that it just varies, right? So sometimes what? it varies people's memories of certain things, right? So it could be the case for an individual that one alter r remembers some things while the other doesn't. It could be the case because distinct alternate personalities isn't what happens for everyone that um, you know that sometimes a per it experiences it as having access to a memory or not, right? But but the part of the criteria that is given in the DSM is just that people do have um, gaps in memory that is greater than normal forgetting. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So I am a uh, registered behavioral technician and I am working towards becoming a behavioral analyst. Uh, a lot of the children that I work with are autistic and nonverbal. Okay. And so I'm curious how many times something like DID could be misassociated with autism. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of one of my clients that I worked with who would have distinct periods of different attitudes. So we would be sitting and playing a board game together and then at the drop of a hat, he's punching a wall for no obvious reason or could, how hard and what should I look for as a professional working with nonverbals to maybe bring up to my supervisor and advanced technicians about maybe it's not purely autistic, like maybe blocking the punching of the wall is not the right kind of treatment that we should be looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. I didn't really think about how easily okay. that could get, get um, those symptoms could be uh, overlap or, um, I think for, for me, right, not, not really ultimately at the end of the day, considering myself a DID expert, what I would say to that is, is I think uh, when we have a hammer, everything tends to look like a nail, right? So for me, uh, that was psychosis, right? I was always looking for psychosis. For you, maybe that's always looking for autism. So I think step one is being curious, right? And then from um, my research, I would say, you know, the more you know, the better. But there are also these really great validated tools to help people um, distinguish the symptoms of, of DID. That's something that you could look at, how that presentation might be different in a person who's autistic 
versus someone who um, isn't. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, but maybe there is someone out there that is interested in that. And um, so, th so that's uh, my not answering you, but encouraging you to be curious, right? I think that that's great. Mm. Whereas when they're nonverbal, you're not talking to them, you're interacting. And so, yeah, see if there's any tools out there right. that can help you identify those shifts in personality. Because that would certainly, I think, put a really big barrier to it, right? If someone's not able to speak about their experience in a way that might, might cue you into what's going on for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking about the diagnosis uh, criteria for DID, would you say that? Bruce Banner slash the Hulk would count, ignoring the gamma ray exposure as a medical condition? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to discount if anyone uh, ever personally identified with that experience. I think, um, I think that it is meant to sort of represent um, that in a way, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, if Marvel wanted to, they could portray it more in that way that would be respectful and more aligned with it. I, uh, I think even in the most recent She-Hulk, the way that Bruce talked about his relationship to, to the Hulk seemed a little bit more like thinking of him as an alternate personality, um, where I don't think he, in the rest of the MCU, he had really talked, talked about him like that. Um, and, they, and then you know, ultimately becoming Professor Hulk, being sort of like an integration of two, two halves. Hi. Um, you talked about how it's not often that there are like a complete shift from one personality to another mm -hmm. in cases of DID. So I'm wondering in terms of diagnosis, when you meet somebody that might have DID, how you classify um, like identifying those alter personalities when there isn't a complete shift between one and the other, when maybe that there isn't, maybe there like one just like sort of peeks in or like makes an appearance or colors the original personality or something. I'm just wondering how you distinguish when there isn't a complete shift. Yeah, so I think that um, DID specialists, as I understand it, well, they would really be advocating for the use of these validated tools that don't just, so the, prob the ultimate problem with the DSM diagnosis is it just says, basically it just says there are different personalities, right? And it doesn't talk about how you would like pick up on that um, and it can be so subtle that maybe maybe you wouldn't reliably just on your own be doing a good job so they really advocate for the use of these standardized tools that you would go through and be like is this symptom present is this symptom present is this symptom present I probably should have shown you guys one of those so I apologize for that but they do exist so you were talking about how some people they don't believe that this is a valid diagnosis say that they have like a patient come in who they're experiencing the dissociation they're experiencing um, the loss of time those symptoms and their friends have noticed that during those times they have complete shift in personality like might be acting like completely totally different people and their friends have told them this they've taken note of this before coming into the office what do these therapists who are skeptics think is going on in that kind of situation um, what is their approach to that? What to look out for for somebody who might be, you know, furthering that stigma or providing the incorrect kind of treatment? Um, are you asking me to sort of like explain the logic of someone who ultimately doesn't believe in dis dis dissociative identity disorder as a valid diagnosis? Is that what you're asking me? So um, I'm wondering like what kind of diagnosis are they thinking that it might be instead oh. if it's not presenting with the typical things that would also accompany schizophrenia or something? Yeah. Um, I think what might they think that it is so that, you know, if you know somebody who's going through that and they say, oh, well, my therapist said that it was this and you're like, well, that doesn't sound right. What kind of thing to look out for from somebody who might be a skeptic? Yeah, I think um, I think that uh, really it, it boils. I think m a lot of times it's like the hammer nail thing again. So if a, if someone's a PTSD specialist, maybe they would just diagnose. P maybe they do meet criteria for PTSD and they're just diagnosing PTSD and missing the DID. Right in my in my practice, it was schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder. Right, that was what 
people were referred to us for, if that's like what we were always thinking about. And it was a lot of effort to, to ask that extra question. Um, and I think, I think that that just happens period. Like it, it isn't just limited to DID. I think that uh, that's kind of uh, a fault. It's a uh, anchoring is um, the cognitive uh, bias that, that people do. They, the, the last thing they thought about, the last, last thing they learned maybe, the thing they think about all the time, they're sort of jumping to that. And, um, or were you asking like, how could you advocate maybe? No. I have a friend who's going through this process right now. And like the first couple of doctors that she went to, they all gave her totally separate diagnosis oh. that they, it was really hard to tell that they didn't know what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. It was hard as a friend who was also studying psychology, even without that, like I could tell that something was off, but I wasn't sure what to look for when she was talking to me about her confusion with the doctors to kind of tell her, you know, have you considered a dissociative specialist or something like that? Because that was her biggest thing that we had noticed was the dissociation and the personality changes. And it took her like four years before she found a dissociative specialist. And so just wanting to know in the future when somebody's talking to me and something sounds off, what kinds of things should direct me towards that if that makes sense yeah I mean um you know I wish I had a like if this do that but really this is my sort of philosophy in life and in practice which is to be curious right as a friend I'm always trying to advocate for them and if I see something share it if I can go with them to an appointment go just like you did right and you know if someone gives you I think it's really common to get multiple different diagnoses from different providers that's like just like a very common experience uh, from for people in mental health um, and that's kind of why I'm really big about the recovery model because like maybe we don't get an answer of like this is definitively what's going on we're constantly striving towards that we're constantly working towards it um, but really like how are you able to live the life you want and what helps you get there along that way right and so um you know i think it's great to push medical providers to consider other things and if they're not right and they're really just like stuck in their one position then to to, to go to someone else mm -hmm. okay we have uh time for probably two maybe three more people if they're quick so here you go okay so before I ask my real question, I'm going to preface it with another question. Okay. Have you seen the TV show Mr. Robot or heard of it? No, but I meant to. I had all okay. these shows yeah, I was supposed to watch before this. Okay, then you, you know I, why I'm probably asking this. I was going to ask like your opinion on like how accurate the depiction of this diagnosis is in the show. But if you haven't seen it, then I highly recommend watching it. Okay, Anyone else you. in the room I too, because it's pretty good. Um, while they're walking, I'll answer some that were on the thing. So what professionals worked alongside the writers of Moon Knight to ensure the representation of DID was well done? I didn't actually come across that in my research, but I do know that they, I, I did read about um, Isaac, I forget his name, the, uh, the actor, um, talking about, hmm? Oscar Isaac, talking about how he felt like the production really was trying to be, to, to represent it truly, but I don't know they had yes uh, in, in the dissociative case it would appear that there is generally one personality that is the dominant personality or the primary personality that a professional would speak to and I'm wondering if there is any appearance that that uh, ordering can change over time if a, if a personality that is, that is not the dominant one, not the one that's running things, might take over from uh, the one that is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's different for different people, but maybe I'll just speak about um, the alter system uh, dissociated that I mentioned. Uh, they um, do talk about there are uh, different alters having different roles. So primarily uh, the person who was running dissociated the YouTube channel for a while was uh, Nin. And then that changed later um, when Nin and uh, another alter integrated. So in the series, the artistic choice that is made to let the audience know that Stephen and Mark are talking to each other is the use of reflections. I'm curious how 
that based in reality is that or is that more purely an artistic choice? Um, I don't know if anyone has ever experienced that uh, who has dissociative identity disorder. I have sort of, I, I thought about mentioning it because I see that sort of device used a lot to, in media, like also for, to represent voice hearing and psychosis. So um, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I, I know I interpreted it as sort of just like a artistic, artistic way of representing uh, them communicating with themselves within themselves. Okay, uh, this will be the last question. I'm a therapist and I have several schizoaffective clients. Um, a lot of times um, that will present with delusions that are hard to kind of piece out. Um, so I was wondering how frequently does a multiple, or excuse me, dissociative identity disorder look like delusion or how do you piece those out? Yeah, I think, um, so I have a lot of uh, professional experience uh, Think, thinking about that and I think um, it definitely can uh, look the same I also originally thought about showing you guys a case based off of my my one really big case where it was just like there was this split in between our, our team where some people were like dissociative identity disorder some people were like schizoaffective disorder and the people who were like schizoaffective disorder were the physicians and so that was what was on the chart and meanwhile all these other people on this person's healthcare team were trying to advocate for um, something else and so I think I think um, I think it is really hard to tease apart um, just to sort of um, validate you there right it's been difficult for me and I think that that's why you know the problem with the diagnosis just like looking at that, taking that diagnosis at face value, the problem with anchoring, you know, thinking, well, it's on the chart, so that's what it must be, right? And being curious about, you know, if this person, especially if the person isn't doing well, right? Like how horrible if we're just missing this hu this bigger picture and it's because we're throwing antipsychotics on something that like, no, that's not appropriate treatment, right? Okay. Uh, that is the end of the panel at this point. If the panelist wishes, she can go outside and answer any other questions that anybody else may have, but that, yes, is, up to, that is up to you. I will. <laughs> uh, remember to donate to the charity if you wish to. Uh, we have Jurassic Park is a Terrible Zoo coming up in the Hilton Crystal Ballroom <laughs> at 4 o'clock. So have fun with that. <laughs>